Hi guys, welcome once more on It's a Dharmar podcast. This is episode 11 and today we have one person that I'm a huge fan of. He makes unique kind of realistic 3D art creatures, characters that will blow your mind and I'm sure that you already know his work. His name is Ian Spriggs. Hi Ian. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so happy to have you on this stream. I, th I think it's going to be amazing. Actually, I know it's going to be amazing because your work <laughs> is out of this world. Well, I, maybe I, yeah, my work might be okay, but let's see if I can talk about it. If I talk about it, it might not be as good. No, no, no. I, I'm sure it's going to be amazing because every time when I saw your work and many other people online, our, our mind, mind explodes because that's a totally different level and totally different experience to see something like that. And I'm super curious to talk with you about it. Oh, that's nice. Thanks. Yeah I'm, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to our conversation now. So what's the time at your place now? You are in Vancouver, right? Yeah, Vancouver, Canada. It's uh, 8 o'clock. Oh, Just finished the work day and got back home and now chatting with you. Nice. I woke up, as I told you, at 5 a.m. just so I can have this stream. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, Ian, how did it all start for you? Or how did you start doing 3D? And were you before a 2D, cons 2D artist or it started with 3D immediately? How did it go? Uh, it was... Well, I've always done art. I've always done it since I was a kid. Like my mom would teach me like how to do the basic drawings. Like you don't draw noodle arms, you draw elbows, stuff like that. But it was, uh, I went to art school. Uh, so I went to art school for like five years. I, I don't know. I wasn't really a fan of it. I didn't really, I don't know. It kind of pushed me away from me doing like realistic stuff. They were always pushing more against the expressionist type of feeling, more abstract. Oh. Like, yeah. I wasn't really interested in that. I was always I was always drawn to like the face and doing like hyperrealism. I see. So you always loved hyperrealism and doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Did it so, frustrate you in the beginning? Because I know when I tried hyperrealism from the start, it frustrated me quite a lot. You know. Oh, it's super challenging. It's yeah. There's like I think it's actually one of the most challenging things you could do. Like I, there's a difference, but there's a. So there's a difference between photorealism and hyperrealism. Photorealism is like you're trying to mimic reality like one to one. So you just take a random photograph and you just copy it. So everything's like this. Everything looks the same. And then hyperrealism is derived from photorealism, where it's more about the expression and the uh, the emotion that uh, photo like expresses. I see. So it's more about the subject, the matter, and the contents. So that's what I'm more focused on. But it's still a very real subject but it's focusing on the emotional side mm, i see i see so you didn't like that much school because in which school was it sorry uh so our school was uh alberta college of arts and design but oh. after that after that i went to uh, seneca in toronto mm. so that was that was pretty awesome that was a life-changing experience because it was like i was i actually almost failed art school okay I, I, I can't see that happening but <laughs> Well, you see, <laughs> how how did that happen? Because you didn't like it that much, and you were avoiding it, or or what was happening there? No, I was just I kept on drawing realistic stuff. Like I kept on wanting to draw people, so they didn't really like it too much. They wanted to force me into areas I did I felt uncomfortable in. So they just I don't know. I yeah, they almost failed me I from it. Almost... So I had to kind of do what they said, otherwise I was gonna lose, like get kicked out. So I ended up just doing it just to get, get my grades. But then afterwards, after school, I moved to Montreal, Canada. I see. And I just started drawing again. And I just started drawing faces and draw, getting back into it. And then when I went to Seneca, that's when I started learning 3D. And that's when I really started loving the whole aspect of creating characters and all this stuff. Mm, so the 3D woke up that inner beast in you that's going to create amazing, <laughs> amazing artwork that we know today. Yeah, I guess you could say that, yeah. Uh, I'm, for example, one of those artists uh, that can't live without 3D. I know how to do 2D, but 3D is my passion. And when I'm in the 3D, I feel like I'm, I'm in a natural environment. I'm sure it's like that for you also, right? Yeah, it's become like such a good tool. Like, it's like a paintbrush. You get just, Once you get used to the tool, it's just you become efficient in it. Uh, I've just got so used to doing 3D, I can kind of express what I want through it. So it's pretty good. Yeah. Which, which what software do you use when you are making your artwork? Uh, Maya 
uh, Mudbox Photoshop for some finalizing stuff. Uh, I render in V-Ray. Mm. Uh, X-Gen for the hair. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Mm, I see. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember last work that you posted, and it was Andrea, Andrea Lorenko, the, uh, the organizer of THU. Oh, yeah. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the one. That's Andrea. I met Andrea in uh, last year on THU Malta, and uh, when I saw that, I was like, "Man, Andrea is standing in front of me. Every, <laughs> every, every detail is spot on. Even his position and his expression—that's him." Yeah, th thanks. It did you know? Did you notice he has a tattoo? Yeah, yeah, I saw that. I saw that. <laughs> I, I never knew that until I was started doing a portrait of him. I yeah. took a whole photo references and I was like oh man you got actually a teach you tattoo <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that he now has also on his back you know <laughs> so, <laughs> probably <laughs> so guys look at this this is a 3d model it's insane insane look at the quality of it look at the 3d shader that Ian is showing you it's 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 crazy it's crazy guys <laughs> so, there we go so so it's 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 so fascinating what, what, were, what was your learning curve to learn something like this and to have this kind of eye that can perceive all of this detail and translate them to the to the 3D? How, how did you learn? Was there anything specific during your your career or how you learned? That's a good question. Uh, I think it's just like you just build up on top of... You just build it up. Like each portrait I do, each character, every model I do, I'm trying to make it better than the last one. Yeah. And then you kind of, you got to learn from it. You can't, uh, it's not like you're, you're not a robot. You can't just keep on just pumping them out. You actually have to really focus and try and push each boundary as far as you can go. I find like uh, pushing the boundaries is more about, uh, uh, it's like being focused when you work. Like when you're doing your artwork, you're focused and you're actually making conscious choices of what is what looks good and what looks bad. Yeah. So it's like well, you're more like you're more working more intelligently than just like working like because you you only have a certain amount of artworks you can do in your lifetime. You think you might have like a, like a, an inf infinite number of artworks, but you're actually limited on time. So you got to work smarter and actually get the stuff down, which is important, and then work on that stuff. Yeah, that's that's so important to be conscious when you are doing art. And I'm so glad that you said that because many people when they're doing art, they just want to draw and they don't want to think. And I think that that process, when you enter that meditation, I'm sure you get that kind of a moment where you enter meditation while you're working and your concentration is so focused in that model. Yeah, like don't get me wrong, it's like you, there is a meditation in it and it's pretty relaxing when you can actually get into the zone and start working. But it's like this is a combination of being consciously aware of what's happening and making conscious choices of what looks good, what looks bad, and then also being in the zone of being relaxed so you can actually work for hours on end and not and time flies by. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's it's fascinating. To me, it's fascinating. Like, And I remember that the first time I saw your work, it was an auto-portrait of you. It was, oh, I... it was five years ago done, right? This one, yeah. Yeah, look at this. Look at this. <laughs> Five years ago. Brilliant. That was, yeah, that was a long time ago. That was my first portrait I did. That was your first portrait? Yeah, I did. I've done characters before, but that was my first uh, portrait I've done mm. myself. No, no, everything. Look at I when I remember seeing, and uh, but the first thing that was on my mind was look at the t shirt and the arm. It's like a real one. It's like <laughs> a real one, and I was like blown away. When I started this, I uh, I just quit a, a company, Mr. X. Mr. X is a pretty cool company. I really enjoyed working there, but it was a company, and they always had deadlines. So every time I would get a character to yeah. model, I would be like, all right, you got to do it in two weeks. Now you got to do it in a week. And I said, like, time got so crunched that I, I felt like quality was being pushed out a bit. Yeah. So when I left the company, I just spent a couple months where I just – I had like unlimited time, so I just did my self portrait. I did a portrait of my brother, portrait of my sister in law. And I was just, I gave myself no deadlines. It was just quality was more important to me than time. So I wasn't worried about how long it was going to take. So this is when this kind of came out. Mm. I just wanted to see how far I could push myself without having the time crunch. 
So, so you don't like when you have a crunch on you when it's pressuring you because somehow I can't see somebody pressuring anybody with this kind of work. There has to be, you know, that longer period of time of working on something like this. Am I right or wrong? Well, there's always uh, like when you're working in the industry, there's always a time crunch. Like, there's clients always want stuff faster and cheaper. Yeah, and it's like you're always battling. There's always a battle of like, well. You get that, you get lose quality, and they're like, no, we want to keep the same quality, and it's, you're always fighting back and forth with it. But with personal work, it's like it's pretty awesome because you don't get any restrictions. Like you don't have to sacrifice quality; you can just keep on pushing as much as you want. You've done when you want. When you if you, if you feel like that's enough, I, I feel like posting it. You're just gonna post it. Yeah, I see. So you are now at the moment working as a freelance character and creature artist. I work for a company called uh, Image Engine right now, so okay. I'm going to care to lead the. But yeah, it's pretty good. We got a lot of good projects <laughs> to go. It's busy, but yeah, I'm enjoying it. But yeah, most of my portraits are personal work, so I think some people get confused of what, how I make my money, because some people actually ask me, "Do I make money off my portraits?" Yeah, and the answer is no. <laughs> I just do portraits because I love doing portraits. Uh, I, yeah. I make my money like my nine to six job. And you work there mostly as a creature artist from what I saw. Character and creature actually artists from what I saw. I know you worked on Warcraft, you worked on Vikings, you worked on yeah. Daka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, for work I do like uh, just character stuff. I see. Basically anything character related. What What made you choose the characters and creatures and how how do you approach the work would you like to show us some of, of the stuff from from your pc it would be very nice to see i know that you have a lot of things and you show me before the stream that that you also have talks about hands which are super important and mostly i draw them as sausages so yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh yeah we can uh, quickly go over the workflow uh so for most of my portraits i use the same base mesh nice it's based but it was just like a rig base mesh I have, which I can kind of pose. Uh, I will take a photo shoot. Like once I've found out the subjects and who I want to do, I'll do a big photo shoot of them. Yeah. So for my latest subjects I'm doing, I'm doing one of a, I'm, gonna, I'm not sure exactly when it's going to happen, but it's like Chris Nichols from V-Ray. Ah, okay. I took a whole bunch of photos of him. I took about a thousand photos of him, just as, just for reference. <laughs> And then basically, I'm going to try and figure out like what the composition and lighting I want from it. And then I'm going to basically pose this character you see on screen into the pose, and then start sculpting based on the photo references, and then start lighting it as quickly as possible. Oh, I see. Is that is that uh, that that rig? Uh, that's auto rig in Maya, or? Uh, no, this is my friend uh, Eric Laguerre rigged this one. Ah, okay, I see. Yeah. Yeah, he's a pretty uh, good. He's pretty good. He rigged all the stuff at Oats. Mm, nice, nice. Like that. Uh, do you know the Zygote? Yeah, the Zygote, the project from Oats, right? Yeah, yeah. So he basically rigged that thing. Nice. Um, well, let me just show you that thing quick. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, this thing. Yeah, yeah, I know this. He rigged it. Oh my God! Like how how <laughs> how long it took to rig something like this? I can only imagine. But it's okay. I think it took him like a year to rig this thing. It was pretty cool, though. A but year. yeah, so I kind of sidetracked you on that one. Yeah, but a year <laughs> to rig something crazy, crazy. Rigging is one of the hardest things, but that's a subject, you know, for itself. Yeah, yeah exactly. So yeah, so he, the guy who rigged the zygote, rigged this thing for for me, which is pretty cool of him. Nice. Then, okay. So once we basically pose that into the pose I like. Basically, I'll take this mesh into mud box. And then I just kind of start sculpting a mud box, basically. I have to ask one cash question. Why did you decide to use mud box and not a ZBrush? Okay, see, uh, so this angle, uh, the camera from Maya, it's the exact same cam like the focus length as uh, so that camera here. Yeah. So that camera is the exact same as this one. Okay. So what, when I'm rendering, when I go back and I start rendering this image, I'm like, oh, I got to fix. There's something in the render which like here doesn't look good. 
I can go straight back to Mudbox and be like, oh, it's right here. I know exactly where it is. Mm -hmm. So because you can sync between Maya and Mudbox, the cameras, it's really quite efficient to be able to make revisions down the road. So, so that was the reason why you took a Mudbox and not ZBrush? Ba yeah, basically. Basically just for the cameras. Oh, I, I mean, see. Mudbox has a lot of good features and ZBrush is a phenomenal tool. But I think for, for me, the power of the cameras was more important. I see. I can. I understand that. It's, for me, it's also important when I'm switching between the software like that, so I can see the curve and everything, sure. so I can see where you're coming. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Mudbox is really good for layers too, which is pretty cool. So everything you can put on a layer. To be um, honest, I never used Mudbox. I always use ZBrush, and now when I see it, I'm I'm, I'm looking because it's totally new experience for me. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, also, Mudbox is like user friendly. You could learn Mudbox in like twenty minutes and basically know how to get around it. I can see everybody installing it now and trying to be to work like you. I'm sure. Like, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I don't know. But the tools in ZBrush are better though. Like, like the wax brush, or the grab brush, every all that stuff is a lot better in ZBrush. I think. It feels, uh, ZBrush for me, it feels more like uh, you're sculpting with clay. Whereas this is more, I don't know how to explain it. It's just more like Maya, I guess. Oh, so it has that kind of feeling. But but what do you mean when you say it's more like Maya? Because somehow I'm imagining my head the polygonal modeling. I used to use Maya still six months ago when I switched to Blender because Blender is doing all everything for me now. But how how what do you mean by it's it feels like Maya. Uh, like the I don't know. It's like the brushes don't. I don't know. They don't like <laughs> if you go over like a corner of like if you have a cube and you make the wax brush go over the corner of the cube, it doesn't quite react perfectly. Like ZBrush will be a perfect like a nice. It feels like wa uh, clay just going over the edge, whereas Mudbox it kind of makes a weird little. I don't know how to explain it. It doesn't work perfectly. Okay. So for that aspect, it feels not as accurate. But the ZBrush, I think it's based on a, it's like a 2D. You're actually working in 2D space, even though it looks 3D, I, I believe. Whereas Mudbox actually uses actual 3D uh, programming, I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not sure what the algorithms are. I'm not really a technical guy. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm but not... it, yeah, but you can rotate around Mudbox and it feels a lot like Maya, whereas ZBrush, it feels like you're on a canvas rotating. I see, I see. And how long mostly does it take you to make... Uh, I saw in the last pro uh, portrait that you did with Andre, it took you uh, one month. How long does it take you to make that kind of portraits? And, wh what, is, and what is for you the hardest part of, of making it? Uh, so Andre was actually one of my fastest portraits I've done. It took about a month. And most portraits take between two to three months. I see. Like, so like Scott's portrait, this one took about two and a half months, just because he's got, you got the skull, which he, I had a model. He was actually a reverse forensics of his head. So Scott's actually holding his own head in his hand. Mm, nice. Hold on, I got There we go. So I did actually reverse forensics of his head. Mm. He's actually holding his own skull. So stuff like adding stuff like details like that actually makes it take a lot longer. And then adding hands into a portrait, that hands are just as, as expressive as a face. So yeah. a hand will, will like double the time. And then once you've got a full body, it just adds more time. So based on like props and uh, limbs and stuff like that, it just that can add time to a portrait. I see. When I see that hands that you that that, that are on the screen and uh, they really look expressive and realistic and they are giving the character, a lot of artists are struggling with hands. And for me, when I see something like this, it blows my mind. Like it's like a real hand, like a real it, real hand. Do you mind if I show you? Uh, okay, I got I do a couple talks. I've done a couple talks at THU and Toa Chaos where actually a huge a section of my talk is actually talking about hands. Sure. Uh, I just gotta. Where is it? There we go. Sure. So, okay. So, this is the portrait of Neil Blomkamp. Okay. So, this portrait for Neil, 
Neil's a, like a director of District 9, Elysium Chappie. Yeah. So for his portrait, I wanted him to have his hands in, his, in the picture because having hands in a Renaissance painting, it would cost more money. And if you have hands in the painting, it means you're more wealthy. So yeah. only he could afford the hands. So for Neil being a top director, he, I think it was important for him to have his hands front and center in the piece. Not showing off his wealth, but showing off that he's a top director. So it's almost like a status uh, symbol. So I that's see. why hands in the piece. Uh, so yeah, those are his hands. They actually took like they took longer than his face to model and texture. Oh, like the detail, 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 and detail. Oh my god. So these are all the hands I've done. Not all of them, but some of the hands I've done in some of my, my portraits. And I really try to focus on the expression of the hands because I feel like hands can express a lot more than the face can express. Like uh, the one of Heidi here, you can feel the tension in her fists. The one of my dad here, you can feel like it's more uh, like a relaxed, thoughtful, but he's got like the old veins and like he's got some like uh, wisdom behind him. These are my mom's hands. You can feel the more like gentle, relaxed, like, kind of more caring hands. So I feel like hands that can express this stuff. And if you look at some of the uh, art history, like uh, Bernini's sculpture, you can feel like the tension in the hands. If you start just paying attention, you can really feel like the emotion from these people through what the hands are feeling. Like this person decides that the hands are more expressive than the face, so he just removes the face entirely. Mm. Like once you start paying attention to the hands, and this is Death of Morant, you can feel like the hand's not alive. You can feel like it's pretty dead just from the color of it. And the hand of David, you can feel the strength behind that, but yet it's very relaxed, but you know there's a strength behind it. Yeah. Like Mona Lisa's hands, it feels very gentle. But yeah, you can kind of feel like if you really start paying attention to what hands are doing, your uh, your portraits and characters actually can come to life a lot easier than without the hands. I but see. But it'll take a lot longer to model and texture them. I see. And and what 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 kind of advice would you give to artists how how to approach hands because such a strong element now when when you explain that and I look at it and I'm not thinking about it. It's such a strong element on, in any piece. Is it two D, three D? Doesn't matter. What, what, what is your advice for young people that want to draw hands? <laughs> uh, it's kind of hard. To, okay, I, gotta, I, I kind of got to show you. Okay. So if you draw, I, I'm not very good at drawing. It's been a while since I've drawn anything. Are you going to draw with mouse? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm going to draw with the, yeah, I got something else. <laughs> so hands are all about anatomy. So basically you have to make sure your anatomy is on point. So basically, you got your palm of your hand, and then I always, when I draw hands, I draw like, like the joints first. Okay. So you got your, these are your knuckles, and then you basically you kind of draw each of like the knuckles. Like you obviously use reference, and basically you just kind of connect like the knuckles. And then basically, that's how you'd kind of draw a hand, basically. Like, okay, you got a knuckle there. So you kind of, everything you do with the hands, you kind of block it out to the most simple possible shape. That's a terrible drawing of a hand. Much way. better than, than what I would do. <laughs> Much better than what I would do. But basically, like, you, everything you do is you just block it out to the simplest, simplest shapes. And once you can block it, like, the simpler, the better. And if you can get to the simpler shape and then just build up from there. So you, once you got the proportions, like I just showed you, you can kind of block it out. And then you start building, like, the, the tendons, the, the skeleton structure underneath. There's a bit of muscle, the flesh, the, uh, the skin folds, the nails. You just kind of, like, add it piece by piece. If you think of a hand as a whole, it's too complicated just to do. So you got to break it into the smallest pieces as possible. I see. I see. And, and, and when it comes to clothes, do you use, you, you, you never mentioned when we were speaking, uh, Marvel's designer, do you, do you use that software for clothes or you're doing also in Mudbox the modeling of the clothes? Uh, yeah, I usually just do the, all the clothes in, uh, in Mudbox. <laughs> okay, okay. Nice. 
Do I have a video here? No. Hold on. Yeah, so usually I'll have something like this. And I just kind of sculpt, sculpt the clothes in. All right. I like Mar Marvel's design is amazing. But for me, I just like to have control. I can make it look more like the photo reference when I have control over it. I don't want it like a program to generalize what I want it to look like. So if I sculpt every detail, it takes time. But I don't know. I, I like the control over it. I see. I see. And your models while you're working, do you really top of them in Maya once you're finished and everything so you can optimize the geometry for faster rendering or you export it as the way they are? Uh, yeah, I export it as... Right, this one kind of shows you. So I just export the high res. I don't even worry about displacement maps. Like my, you can render millions of polygons and it doesn't affect render time that much. Mm. So that's, that's the mesh I render. So it's kind of a little bit like over the top, but if I feel, yeah, I feel like it doesn't affect render time as much at all. Like a low polygon or a high polygons, it doesn't really matter for time anymore. I see. I like see. 10 years ago, for sure. But now I think the rendering's got pretty good. Much faster now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that, that, that hair, when I see it, I'm like, I always have in my mind, oh my God, it's going to take thousands of hours to render it. Like, because, and how do, how do you approach that hair? Because from, from what I see on your on uh, your images, the first thing, thing that strikes me is always hair on, on their body. Like, I can see every piece of hair on their body and that's fascinating to me. How, how do you approach that? Do you go one step by step or there is uh, there is some speed up way that you use how, how does it that go i don't think there is a quick way to do hair like before x gen i'd actually just model like noobs curves like thousands of them okay until i got the results i wanted <laughs> in different patches but honestly i'll spend like a month just doing the hair like, i think the portrait of sean was uh the most complicated this guy his hair was one of the most complicated hairs I'd done because I had to do each section and then it was all done in N hair, so this is not X gen. But basically, is you know, I modeled like, I don't know, almost every hair. Basically. It was just insane the amount of work it was. It took me a month and then all the shader set uh, network for it was insane. But now I'm using X gen, so it's a lot easier. But then it extends, it comes with its own problems about having complete control over certain sections without affecting the whole results. I have see. you have you used XGen much? I have never used XGen to be honest. Never used Mudbox, never used XGen. It's a new software to me for me. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty good though. It gives you really good results. I'm still I feel like I'm still a beginner with it, so I feel like there's still a lot I can learn from it. But yeah, we'll see. I've, my next portrait, I'm doing a post on my friend Jeff, and he's got this massive beard. So it's going to be very uh, X-Gen heavy. Mm. I see. But now when we are talking, I see that you do everything manually. And I respect that a lot because then you are a master of your craft. So you are doing every single piece by yourself. And I think yeah. that's the reason why it's so successful. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't really use scans. I'm like, I'm not against people using scans. So I think, like, what, however you get to the final result, however you get there, is fine. Like, as long as you're not cheating and like ripping somebody off, that's however you get there. If you use a scan or if you use whatever program or, or whatever references you have, I don't think there's any way of cheating to get to the final result. Or you, how you express the final result is all that matters. So I'm not against people using scans, but I usually don't use scans for my work. I see. I see. Like, for, I think for like when I'm in the industry, like my nine to six job, I use scans, but for my portraits, I don't. I see. I mean, I can understand that because it's industry and they require faster delivery, so scans are used a little bit to speed up that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And what what you know, what does what does inspire you? What what makes you pumped? Except for the uh, portraits and stuff like that, what inspires you around you? Is there anything special that you like to see? Uh, I, lo I love just going to like art galleries. Oh, I see. Like art, art. I like go to like seeing like old Renaissance paintings. Like going around Europe, like going to like the Louvre and stuff. That's I find that very inspiring. Like some of the artworks which has been done in the past. I absolutely love that stuff. 
Uh, even going to some of my contemporary shows, I enjoy doing that. My brother's an artist too, my older brother. Oh, nice. Yeah. I'm going to show you some of his stuff because he's got some pretty cool stuff. Let's do it. So you're an art family. Yeah, I think so. Nice. So I, David, he's like a, a contemporary artist, so I go to see his work okay. when he has shows. So we kind of talk with uh, with each other. Like he inspires me. I Ooh. try to help inspire him. So I got a lot of inspiration from my brother. So this is uh, what this is, is that. This is David. This is my brother, David. And this is a piece he did. It's all in sheets of mylar. And it Whoa. does like this. 3D that sculptures. Is, that's insane. Yeah, so he's pretty. He's a pretty serious artist. I wouldn't say pretty. I would say he's amazing. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> like, how how was how was that done? How how is this done? <laughs> I mean, what the, what is this? So okay, here we go. So he paints on sheets of mylar. It's kind of like a transparent paper in a way. And then if you paint on them and space them out, you can create like a 3D form from it. Mm. It's almost like a 3D painting. That is insane. And it's so huge. Does, oh yeah, he does some absolutely massive ones. Uh, yeah, this one was a huge one. Whoa. Like, I, I think it was like 50 foot long or something. That is and, huge, huge. <laughs> And I like how he combines light with it. Oh yeah, he's very uh, light. Okay, yeah, he is very. Uh, he's all about light. So, so my my portrait of him, if you actually look at it, where is it? Hold on. So his portrait is kind of based based on light, like he's got the light coming onto oh, his face. Oh, I see, I see. And it's because his artwork is about light, so I made his portrait about light. I see. I will post his uh, link in the chat so people can see. Oh, okay, sounds good. Okay, I posted it. So, so yeah, but you you are an art family. I I never asked you. Oh, what 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 do your parents do? Are they also artists? Because I see they they supported both of you to become artists. Yeah, my dad's an engineer. He's a really good uh, draftsman. Oh, uh, this is my dad. So you did everybody in a portrait, which is amazing. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Whole family springs is there. <laughs> like, yeah, they are. You gotta, like my personal life's gotta be personal. So I just did all my family, and now I'm doing my friends and yeah, people I work with. So yeah, everything I do in my personal work is very personal to me. So that's why I can I love doing it so much. Nice. But yeah, these uh, drawings of my uh, and the background of my dad's portrait are actually drawings he used to do for work. What does he do? What kind of an engineer is he? Uh, he was like piping engineering. But he was working in the, uh, in the oil sands in Alberta for a while. Nice. Yeah, so he's, he, well, I learned a lot from my dad how, how to draw in like the, like the correct way how to do things. Like my dad would like teach me how to do this stuff. He, he taught me how to write my name in 3D. Oh, I, nice. <laughs> I was blown away when he showed me how to do that. <laughs> nice. So, so he's a ter thermo engineer. Thermo engineer, I think, is the is the is the name of of the engineer he is. Oh, okay. Nice. And then uh, my mom, she yeah, she would teach me how to draw elbows <laughs> when I was a kid. But she, she's very. Uh, she's an artist. Very, no, she's not an artist. But well, she used to teach Tai Chi, so I guess you could say she's an. That's an art form. Oh, Tai Chi! I tried try Tai Chi three times. I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, my mom was very supportive of my work. She always has been. She comes to any shows like my brother has, or he is, she's always supportive and tries to watch. She's probably watch, listening to this podcast right now as we speak. Then we need to greet her. Hi, Pamela. It's <laughs> 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 so nice from them that, that they supported you because a lot of artists struggle with that. Their parents don't want them to be an artist, but that's awesome, I think. It sparked that passion. It sparked that passion in you to become a skilled craft, uh, skilled craftsman of your of your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's like it's easy to say that like, oh, I'm I'm the artist. I did everything myself. But really, it's like you you've got help from your. Like I, I have help from my family. 
I have help from people online. Like I've made a lot of friends from the community. People always reach out to me and support. Like, like just other character artists. They just like reach out to me on Facebook and be like, "Hey, I saw your work," and we have conversations. And it's always like you get inspiration from that type of stuff. It's not you're not like an individual but stood by yourself. You're you're with a whole bunch of other people. And I don't really feel like you do it all by yourself. It's a combination of like people's support and everything like that. Yeah, there is also a strong community in art, which I really love and and uh, that supports each other. I really like that. Really, really like that. That we are pushing each mm. other. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. We have a pretty awesome community. It's mm. very different than most other communities. That absolutely. <laughs> that absolutely. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah, so like I don't know. Yeah, it's more support, I guess, which is nice. Yeah. Uh. So yeah, where were we, by the way? Oh yeah, yeah. we came to the render. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh. So so uh, now speaking about the the render, uh, do you UV that because it's a high poly or use uh, paint over it? How how does that work? I never used Mudbox, so I don't know the skin color and everything texture actually. Uh. So, the low res, like this one, this thing would you'd UV this thing. This would be the UVs. Ah, okay. And then you want you just you have to lower uh, UV the low res, and then you bring bring that to mud box. And once you've low uh, UV the low res, you can just start sculpting on top of it. And then basically just you just keep the UVs. So now when I export this to Maya, it's just it's the same. Well, you can't really see it, but it's the same UVs, but just denser. Ah, okay. So, so you okay? I understand. So you raised up the the smoothness and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. But yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, for my look dev stuff, I usually try and keep it pretty simple. Like, uh, it's kind of hard to show you here. But yeah, I usually, most people always ask me like what my skin shaders are, like what my lighting is. And I'll say it's most, most of the time it's just like out of the box stuff. So it's like, I'll just create light and then that's that's it. I don't do anything to it. It's just create red light, press render. My render settings are usually just the default render settings. Really? They're only default render settings? Yeah. What? Yeah, I always thought that there was something, some kind of magic because... I see there is three lights. Oh my god! Oh my god! Like, yeah. So those are my V-Ray render settings. I see. I see. I think it's just yeah. Yeah, I just opened it up and basically just left it how it is. <laughs> <laughs> and you use uh, what kind of lights you use? I see that there is. Is it a three-point light like for a photography or? Uh, okay, so I kind of cheated a little bit. I couldn't get a reflection on this eye the way I wanted to, so I added this light just for the reflection, but this yeah. light doesn't affect anything other than the reflection on the eye. So for Scott's portrait, I think it was just, uh, yeah, I don't think it was that one. I think it was just this one. Uh, I did a little bit of a bounce light, just to highlight just a little bit there, and then just a dome light. And that was it. So just three lights, basically, for Scott's portrait. I see. So, so that, that's, that's the thing, when you have a high quality 3D model, the light somehow becomes not that important and, is, is, and uh, if you have a really bad model, the light becomes more important. That's my experience in 3D when I'm working, you know. So there is not, you don't have to cover the mistakes because your model is already perfect. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think most of the time I'm just, honestly, I think the biggest thing is to focus on the diffuse map. Like the, the, the color, it's like once you get that looking good, basically everything else kind of falls into place. I see. So so that's that's the main thing that gives the uh, the realism to your work, right? Uh, I'm not sure if it's the main thing. It's one of the main things. Oh, okay, sorry. Pardon. I didn't express it good. So it's it's one of the things that you think it's very important, right? Yeah. Okay, so I can tell you three, three, the three things I think are most important in creating a portrait. Please, please. <laughs> okay, Light, lighting is one of the most important things. So my example for lighting, this is a piece by Caravaggio. Uh, this is a piece by Rembrandt. Both of them are holding basically the head. I'm trying to find two 
pictures which are very similar but very different. Caravaggio uses very hard, hard light with like hard uh, shadows. Yeah, and it's a tension. Like you can feel like this guy was there's a tension in the piece. He just cut the head off off of this body, so there's like a tension behind it and the, the way it was lit. Whereas Rembrandt's, it's got a lot softer lighting, a little bit. The shadows a little bit softer, so it doesn't feel tense. It doesn't feel aggressive. It feels more like introspective and more like a soft, more thoughtful. So this is actually Aristotle uh, holding the head of uh, Homer. So nice. it's about so you can actually get a sense that they're very different moods of the piece, which I think so lighting can really, really affect how a portrait's done. And so I was going to give a little side note. This is actually a uh, a portrait of Caravaggio. His, that's his own head. So this is basically a self-portrait. Caravaggio murdered somebody in like in this bar mm. fight right, that was on the run. And then he painted this picture. And I, it's almost like he felt guilty that he murdered this guy. So he painted it himself as being beheaded. That's insane. So it actually, the, his lighting kind of suits maybe his mood he was feeling at the time. So I think lighting is one of the biggest things which can create a mood and feeling of a, of a piece. Uh, composition is huge. Oh. Uh, so yeah, composition is like, you want to keep your eye, you don't want your eye like flowing off the page. Like for Scott, I want you to look at his face and then you kind of like, you come down his arm, you look at the skull, and the skull's basically looking back at his face, so you kind of come back up to his face. So you're constantly in this, like, circular loop where you're, like, you you can't escape. You're, like, it's, the composition's locked you in. So I think, and you also want to feel like there's a balance between left and right. That, that is fascinating, that, what you're showing. It's really fascinating. It shows that you're really think, you're thinking what you're doing. It's, it's incredible. Thank you so much for showing this. So if you go like left to right, it should feel like the balance is basically like, I feel like there's a lot of weight in this section, but I feel like it's like then there's weight on this section. So it's kind of, I feel like there's a bit of a balance. So you can kind of do this a little bit for the composition. You can also play with the thresholds so you can kind of see where the highlights are see where the focus are you don't want like a hot spot to be over here like you don't want to be like oh there's a hot spot over here because there's no reason why you should look there you want mm. to be looking right at the eye most important so you can kind of play with uh, threshold to kind of keep your eye so the like that's where you're kind of looking most of the most of the time so I think composition is a huge thing. And then uh, I think my last one was uh, pose. So po how the person's posed. So Scott Eats, I, I got to tell you a little bit of backstory about Scott Eaton. Scott Eaton's an anatomy, uh, like anatomy instructor. Yeah. He knows everything there's a, to know about anatomy and he teaches that for a living. So for Scott, he's kind of holding a skull, which is basically it's, it's a, his own skull but it's also like a representation of his career because he's holding the anatomy in his hands. He's got a firm grasp of it. Like he's not holding it lightly. He's like, he's like got a firm grasp of his career and what he does. He's taking like his life by his hands and is in control over it. He's also kind of le leaning in towards you like, a, like an instructor would. Like he's not like shy or leaning back he's not lazy he's actually leaning in as if he's like teaching you something and that's what he does he teaches anatomy so he's kind of leaning into you a little bit so i think the pose for scott kind of helps represent who he was as well so i think that helps uh, create believability so yeah i think uh lighting composition and pose are probably three of the most important things nice now now when you explain that I, I, I'm thinking about it all because so much, so many things happening, so many things happening on the image from the skull to him leaning towards. That's that, that it's it's crazy crazy how much it's thought through. You really thought thought through everything, and big respect for me for everything because I could see that, but I would never I would never think about it all. You know, like he did this like this this, and it's incredible. That's incredible to see. I try to hide, uh, yeah. I try to hide a couple secret messages or like 
there's things like that in my work which some people don't really notice, but I think I try to add some in. Uh, my portrait of Erica. So I'm not sure if anybody really noticed this one, but if you look on the top left, there's the rend I left the render buckets. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that. Yeah, mo I don't think most people did. So, uh, hold on. I could it'll take me a few minutes to. It's worth talking about. I think. Hold on a second. Okay, so it's inspired by the Hans Holbein painting. Oh. So I'm sure some people are familiar with this one. So this piece is about like uh, it's kind of like the wealth of clothes and the status, like how clothes represent who we are. Erica, I wanted to, her to show like she's got a fashionable sense. Uh, she's got her dog Carmine, which is a prized possession. But the fact that it's in there, she loves it. And it's who she is. So she's a very caring person. You can tell that by the dog she has. But the Hans Holbein painting basically means that it doesn't matter what possessions you have, what riches you have, what status you have, like death kind of will come to us all. So there's this elongated skull. Mm-hmm. So for Erica's portrait, I included the skull into her earring. Oh, nice, <laughs> nice. So I kind of see it's kind of like a little secret message. But going a little uh, uh, a step further than that, so they got the skull, but Hans Holbein doesn't necessarily believe that death was the end. So at the top left-hand side of his canvas, he has a cross of uh, Jesus. Hmm. So I think like he thought that maybe those could be like life after death. So my interpretation of that would be my render, the render buckets. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like, maybe we can live digitally forever, or maybe we can live uh, like our artwork can be how we remembered, how that can live forever. We can immortalize ourselves this way. So it's like there's, there's all it could mean like a, there's, like an artwork is never finished; it's always a work in progress. Yeah, the, 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 it's fascinating. And the first thing I think of uh, when I was 2007, I think it was uh, maybe you probably know that video. Uh, it was first 3D short film or something like that, where the guy is making uh, his wife is in a coma and he's making her a 3D city. Do you know that video? A 3D city? Yeah, he is making a city. And the 3D wasn't widespread back then, and uh, he's making a city so she can see the so she, he can, uh, she can see the city, you know. So that's the first thing that associated me with when you said the life after and stuff like that. Maybe we can stay in 3D. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe. I have to find that video and send it to you, so you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, send that to me for sure. This is serious. but look, when I, I mean, it's like a photo. It's like a photo, like everything crazy. Thanks. Curtain, lights. No, no, skin, skin, skin is also, I mean, I'm saying about everything, the whole stream, this is fascinating to me, this is fascinating, but to, to be honest, everything is fascinating. I can, I can digest every detail and say, the, to the tiniest piece, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked how good it looks. Oh, thanks, I appreciate it. That is yeah. so cool. So cool. Uh, yeah, so going back to, uh, Oh yeah, they're in. I guess yeah, we basically went and covered the workflow, didn't we? Uh, yeah, yeah, we did. We did cover the workflow. That is, that is, is. but uh, which which masters do you like? Because you mentioned Caravaggio. Do, is there any specific master that you like the most? And there is multiple ones. Yeah, there's kind of multiple ones. Uh, so Van Dyke was one of my inspirations. He's one of my favorite ones. Uh, my mom's portrait was based on this one. Nice. Uh, I like obviously I can Rembrandt. Like most of my work is based on somebody's piece. Like this is a Sargent piece, which is based my portrait of Graham and Amanda is kind of based on. Uh, where is it? So yeah, it's like most. I just like there's not like one particular artist in history I, I pick over everybody. If I did, maybe it was Rembrandt. Yeah, like my my self portrait is kind of based on Rembrandt. This is a Goya. My portrait of Heather was based on this one. Uh, Where's my nice? There we go. So my little Rembrandt. Oh, so cool! 
So yeah, there we go. So that was kind of based a little bit on this piece. So Rembrandt, what he did was, which was pretty cool, was he basically painted self. These are all self portraits of Rembrandt's, and basically it's almost like an autobiography of his life. Mm. Instead of writing a novel or whatever, he just decided like imagery was more showed represented who he was a little bit better. Like he could express a more more through an image than he could through words. So basically, you can see every. You can kind of see him happy. You can kind of see him sad at different states of who he is. You can see him young and old. You can see him through his lifetime, basically. So it's basically, that's the power of portraiture. So basically, I, when I started off my portrait series, that's kind of where I wanted to go. I wanted to show off my life, show who I was. It's kind of like my portraits are kind of a representation of who I am. I show, I only do my friends and my family and people who have infected, affected me in a, in a positive way because it's like, it's my life. I don't want to just pick some random, like, Brad, like your portrait of Brad Pitt because I've never met him. I've, I'm not connected with him in any yeah. way. So, like it wouldn't, uh, he's not affected my life. So I try to do people who are close to me, which kind of represents who I am a little bit more. I, I, I totally understand you. You want that connection because the connection brings a little bit that extra love that you can put into the work. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I see. So many cool. But, but as you said, you're not drawing in 2D anymore. It's mostly 3D. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think I've touched uh, 2D since I started 3D. So 2006, I don't oh. think I've... Long time ago, long time <laughs> ago. 15 years almost. Yeah, it's true. I should get back into it though. I got, that's one thing I kind of wish I always kept up. So like, I don't know, one drawing a day for 15 years, then it was like, I'll be pretty good, I guess. <laughs> That would be one big book if you publish it. <laughs> yeah, maybe. 50 kilos. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's fascinating Like uh, when artists do that kind of stuff and when they're doing a sketch every day or a 3D every day, uh, it, it, it leaves the legacy. It leaves something for people to see. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and when, it, when it comes to the tattoos, you also have to redraw them all, right? From the so scratch. We we use the tools from scratch. No, no, the tattoos, tattoos on his hand, and you have to redraw them right as a texture completely. Yeah, usually each portrait I start off from basically yeah from scratch. Even though I use the same base mesh, I like there's not much I can really reuse. Mm, I see. Like even the eyes, it's like it would be nice to just get like a generic eye, which I can use for the same portraits. But every time, it's like the eyes are very different than each portrait, so they're always changing. Will you maybe make producing some kind of book in near future for for your work? Because I think many people would love to see. It would be nice. Yeah, I'd love to be able to do that at some point. Maybe I've got. I'm not sure how many portraits I have now. I think I've got like twenty, maybe. Yeah, maybe a couple more, and then a book would be kind of cool. I think, oh, no. I think people would love to see that, because it's also exhibitions and stuff like that. I, I would be the first one to come and watch and buy the book. Yeah, I, I actually have my first art show coming up. Really? When is that happening? And uh, where? It's going to be in Los Angeles at the Nonum School. Nice, nice. Yeah. Be my first uh, art show I've ever had. I've always wanted to have an art show, and it's never happened until uh, I think two months from now. It's going to be, uh, I think it's August third in LA. August third. You hear that, guys? August third. Spread the word so so many people can enjoy Ian's art. I think it's incredible. Yeah. So yeah, they'll print my work out, which I've never. I've actually never seen my work printed out, but that'll be kind of cool to see. It's, it, it will be fascinating to see it. You have to print one of those, uh, you know, the images when there is half 3D and the other half is realistic render. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think when people would see that, they would be like, whoa, 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 like I was, like every time. And what I wanted to ask you was, you do character and creature art. Uh, do Are you involved in the design of them or you go from somebody's sketch? How does that work in, in on the projects where you work? Uh... So sometimes for like my work stuff, uh, I usually most of the time I get a concept 
I don't have to model from the concept. And sometimes I might finalize it a little bit, so I do a little concepting. But uh, it kind of depends. It's a give or take. Like the, the stuff I did at Oats Studio, like all this stuff, this uh, this one, like Neil gave me complete freedom to do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was like, basically, he showed me a sketch by this cool concept artist who did kind of like the first initial zygote. He was like, this is kind of the direction I want to go, but basically I want you to do whatever you want. Just make it cool. I want lots of hands, lots of feet. Just stick it all together and then just see what you can do. And basically he gave me complete freedom over this creature. Same nice. with... Uh, it's looking epic. Yeah, so this, the one we did uh, for Raka, he basically gave me freedom of this one too. ADI did the, the first pass which was which had a different head and a very different body. And so basically he gave me that model. I was like, all right, this is cool, but we want to change it a bit. Can you change the head, change like the scales and stuff? So I ended up changing that quite a bit. So I was able to have uh, complete freedom over this one as well. I see, I see. And how long did it take you to finish? Uh, for example, that a uh, uh, lot of arms piece for a zygote. How long, oh, how long did it take you to do something like that? Man, that was, that was a long time because I modeled it and textured it. Uh, I don't know. It's probably like six, seven months, I'd say. Nice. That's that's a lot of time. That is really yeah. a lot. But there is a lot of there is a lot of work there. Look how many arms and everything there. That's that's really a lot. Yeah, it's like we ended up having to have a we needed like a flex shape, like a blend shape. So each hand had to have like a muscle flex. Mm. And for some reason, I, I kind of messed up on the UVs, so I couldn't do like an automate, auto, automate it throughout all of them. So I actually had to manually go through every single hand. Oh, and my, God. oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It was a lot of work, but it was pretty fun. I'll do it. If I had a chance to do it again, I probably would. <laughs> nice. Nice to hear that. By the way, guys. Uh, Hit the subscribe button because we'll be bringing more guests like this. Also, if you have some questions for Ian, please type them in in comments so I can read them to Ian and, and he can he can answer them. Uh, we are finishing in 20 minutes, so you know. Okay, and uh, you started showing, showing us uh, Andre. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I met yeah. him last year on TG, as I told you, and he, it, it, it is him. It is him from the post to everything. That's Andre. Like, okay, how is the TG going? And I can Im I can see him holding his hand like that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I think any time I've ever seen Andre, he's been super tired. Yeah, 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 and he's always mentioning it. <laughs> you don't even need to ask him, how are you, Andre? When he's passing next to you, he says, I'm super tired. <laughs> so, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, Andre was... Uh... He was the first person to ever get me on stage. Really? So I spoke at uh, Trojan Horse Was a Unicorn at, in uh, Portugal two years ago. That was the first time I ever spoke publicly about my work. So it was, in a way for me, it was kind of like, uh, it gave me like more confidence about being able to talk about my work and do like podcasts and just be more like, I don't know, more vocal about my thoughts and process. So it's like he, because he put me on stage. He actually, I felt like it was a. He pushed me to be a like a better person, better human. So I wanted to do a portrait of him to kind of thank him to for allowing me to do that. Very nice from you. Very nice from you, and uh, nice, uh, very nice from him to to invite you because you totally deserve to give more like more lectures. Uh, Drawing horse is huge, and I'm really glad that you gave their lecture because. You deserve it, man. You really deserve it. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you, uh, you gave a lecture this year in, uh, on Total Chaos in Bulgaria. Will we, yeah. see you, will we see you anywhere else also giving a lecture this year? Uh, uh, probably not. I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> I think Andre has invited me back to uh, Trojan Horses a Unicorn this year. Okay. So that'll be in Malta, which is I'm really looking forward to. Pretty oh. excited. So cool because I will be there also this year. I, I can't wait to meet you in person. Oh, <laughs> so, you're gonna be there? Yeah, I will nice. be there. I will be there. I can't wait to, to meet you in person. Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. But yeah, so I'll be there. And then uh, just, yeah, so THU and Total Chaos, I think, is it for this year. Nice, nice. Yeah, the THU, uh, 
it's gonna be a let's give a little commercial to andre teaching of this year is gonna be insane i heard there's gonna be 1200 people because two other festivals are not working and guys for everybody I, who is an artist designer i strongly recommend going to teach you because the experience is on a whole different level S something similar to ian's work when you see his 3d it's on a whole different level to others so it's the same with thu <laughs> it's like uh i don't know how to explain it. it's like burning men mixed in with like ted talks <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that's the uh, that's the way to go that's the absolutely <laughs> way to go because yeah. You meet everybody from the industry. It's crazy. All of all of all of the people are artists, and the organization is so high. Uh, a lot of stuff happening for a whole week, and I love to go to the, to THU. I was last year amazing, amazing. I think the first time I went there, I ended up just ch like you just chat to people. You don't know who you're chatting to, and then uh, like I was talking to one guy, and after like half an hour, I'm like, oh, so so what do you do? He's like, oh, I'm the director at Disney. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens. But 1,000 people, man, you can't know everybody. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's cool because everybody's like on a, there's nobody, nobody's above anybody else. Everybody's on the same level playing field. So anybody can chat to anybody. Everybody's just there to have a good time. It's pretty cool. Yeah, everybody's so nice. And then a lot of people realize then that high-end artists are normal people that you can talk to and that's that's super fun yeah yeah exactly but yeah that's kind of why i wanted to do a portrait of andre because i don't know i think he influences a lot of people so i think having a portrait of him is pretty cool you 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 you, you, you need to add him a little trial course you know on his shoulder <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's saying i'm tired <laughs> yeah should have had a little riding a unicorn or something yeah because that's the yeah, mascot for the Trojan Horses Unicorn. Nice, nice. Uh, guys are asking, uh, we have one question, and they are asking, how can they get into your exhibition on August, August the 3rd? Uh, hold on a second. I gotta... Uh, what was the art gallery? Okay, so this is, I think this is the event. So I'm pretty sure if you go to this website, I'm pretty sure I'll, my name will pop up here somewhere at some point. Okay, I will post it in the chat. So it's a gnomon, guys, and you have to wait until they publish that exhibition is coming and you will be able to check how you can go there. Yeah, I already found out officially, like yesterday, that it's going to happen, so... They've not really gone ahead with anything just yet. Okay. I will post it in the comment chat. Sounds good. Well, will you maybe, uh, will you maybe, be, uh, have you ever considered printing your work? Uh, I, yeah, I'd like to. Like, I think for this uh, gallery, they're going to print it. Uh, V-Ray actually printed my work out and they actually have it on the, the gallery walls. And that's actually how Andre saw my work for the first time. He went to V-Ray, he saw my work on the printed out on the walls, and then he was like, oh, who's that guy? I want him to come to Total uh, Children Horses of Unicorn. So that's how I first met Andre. But yeah, I've, I've actually never seen my work printed out in person. Nice. I think... yeah. yeah, I'd love to see it at some point. It would, be, it would look probably like holding a little human, a real little human. <laughs> Maybe. I like to think of it more as like a, I don't know, like a Renaissance painting or something. If it was more like, like the, you like the gold gilded frames. No. Yeah, I can, I can totally imagine it like that. Yeah, I think that'd be pretty cool. It would be fascinating. So we covered most of the topics today. So yeah, that's, that's, that it's, it's, it, it was amazing to see your work and I, I really enjoyed this stream because, as I said in the beginning, and I will say it one more time, I, I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan. If you ever publish a book or anything, I, I will be the first one to buy it. <laughs> Thanks. So that's it, guys, for today's stream. Uh, I want to thank to Ian for coming. It was a big pleasure to have you here. And I hope, I can't wait to meet you on a Trojan horse was a unicorn this year on Malta. So we hang out and grab a couple of drinks on me. Perfect. Sounds good. 
Thanks for everybody who joined in on the uh, listen, the conversation too. Thank you guys for joining. Hit the subscribe button. We'll be bringing more artists. Have a great day. Bye, Ian. Bye.